I'm really happy to be here in uh, Kadenia again. So it's really a joy to uh, be here and um, talk to uh, the people, although you're only online, which I really think is a pity. Um, because I really had hoped that it would be a little bit of audience that would say, are you happy to be back again here in Kadenia Design Days? And that everybody that would be there would say, yes, we are. Um, so... I'm really happy, though, uh, that I can talk to you online and I really want you also to interact with me and to chat with me and to let me know what you think about things. And I want to start also with think uh, thanking uh, the Cadenia Design Days team that are really sincere colleagues. They're big and good colleagues from mine. Uh, we took the trip from Holland uh, around, uh, well, I think it was 15 hours drive, but I really love to be here. Uh, in the north of Poland and near the sea. It's a beautiful region and I'm really going to promote it. I hope there are not going to be too many tourists, though. That's a problem of these times. Um, and it was a little bit less during COVID. I do hope, of course, for everyone that things will go better also from an economical point of view. But today we're talking about um, design for solidarity. And uh, this brings me first to me. Uh, I had a life before 2001, really, uh, but um, it was not so much focused on design yet as it is nowadays. So um, in the beginning from 2001, I was volunteering uh, also for the Week of Design that this year has its 20th uh, edition, the Dutch Design Week nowadays. Um, so you can check out what I've been doing uh, uh, when you look online, but I've always been building bridges with many people together, uh, of course with designers, but also with people um, that are clients of designers or users of what designers make uh, or are co-designers. And uh, I think it's very important that everybody knows the value of design and also maybe understands that they can be a little bit the designer themselves. Um, last year, something happened, though, even uh, because it was a bizarre year, of course, uh, 2020. Uh, but everything went online. And I think that um, I was really happy to be voted or elected for the Bureau um, of Design, European Design Associations in the board um, and also in the Executive Board of World Design Weeks, because both are international organizations that are working on the support of the design sector and also connecting the design sector, you could say, in the end, worldwide. And that's what we need, my friends, uh, because we need solidarity. Um, I'm really also like very um, uh, kind of really, well, in all modesty, like, oh my God, I can talk in the region of solidarity, the region that has really um, marked the history uh, from the 1980s with the uh, trade union that um, where people really united to um, make a change to look into how things could change for the better because there was this unfair system and they achieved this and not only in Poland so it, I think it's really wonderful and beautiful that I'm here in this crowd and I hope to see the museum coming week uh, I'm really getting like uh, chick booms maybe also because it's a bit um, cold here in the studio but then still um, no it's really so important that solidarity also will mark these days um, for instance I stepped in the car after having my second vaccination and we drove to Poland I am one of the lucky persons um, in the Netherlands uh, around 70% of the people are almost vaccinated they're even thinking about having he healthy school kids vaccinated but a few weeks ago, I hear this Kenya news item or news item on Kenya, the elderly people. And it was really so touching because, of course, I know that it's that there are things going on and that is really unfair. But when you see these elderly people that say, we also still want to live, we don't want to get ill, we don't want to be sick. And only 2% of the people in Kenya were vaccinated at that time. And that's not only, of course, for this country. So solidarity. I was thinking, okay, I came here in 2019 and I spoke about polarization and now I'm speaking about solidarity. So there was a crisis in between, you could say, to make this really huge step ahead, like really a progress. Um, but solidarity is not there. Uh, I think this story illustrates this. And I think it's really needed that we are going to be solidary uh, in this world. I think the uh, speakers of the other, they have already... Uh, explained it in, in many different ways um, and I'm going to explain it through my way by uh, looking at designers I, I've been working with, I work with, I really uh, think their work is so important and I think we need to see how we can work together with them.
Because um, Solidarność was a movement and we need another solidarity movement. A movement that really will focus on the planet. Um, solidarity is also about oneness and we are on one planet and we are one world. Uh, we have um, uh, uh, borders, but they are a kind of artificial, you might say. And we really are um, at this moment really dealing with challenges that really are borderless and are touching upon everyone. And the only way to solve it is by getting together and to unite and there solidarity comes in. So we need to have people understand what's happening by first of all creating awareness and understanding to see what the problem is really about and to empower them to see how they can indeed do something. Them, even if it's small, you don't need to be a big hero. We can do really make the really steps, little steps, th those actions, and then really kind of really inspire other people or disseminate your ideas. So let's create movements. And um, you are all online, but I really want you to focus really well on what I'm saying right here. And ideally, I really do hope that you come back with your uh, comments, because I want you to look into the different designers that I'm going to show to you right now. And you choose a designer that you want to be um, united with, like in the movement. Uh, let's invent that everybody will start his own movement um, and then get together in the end by um, the different fields touching each other anyway. So supporting solidarity. Designers do that, like Frank Kolkman. Uh, Frank um, is a designer, um, you could say, hacking the health system. What he has been doing still now is um, really looking into possibilities. Uh, what can we do with future technologies? How can we use them to create better solutions for people? And he has been invited by the Kyoto uh, Institute of Technology to look into how we can help people that have a, um, an illness. Um, an illness that is really not so, it, they call it obscure. Um, obscure because not so many are affected by that illness, but they also need to be cured or to be helped. So he has been um, working with fruit flies, so the small flies, and he invented a kind of tool, a test kit, um, uh, a tool that could be used by the patients themselves. They could do the, uh, the, the research with the drugs to see whether it worked. It was really all really well done. Uh, patients would really be empowered to help the process of finding a drug for their own illness. And this is something that you can call, say, hacking the system. Uh, and Frank um, does many other projects like this. At this moment, he is the ambassador for our World Design Embassy of Health. Uh, the thing is, though, that um, Frank has not yet achieved uh, a real, um, well, pharmaceutical company saying, OK, I'm going to do this because this is so important. So we really need to work on this. And then there's also like we are um, human beings and we feel like we're on top of everything. And actually we're not. Um, we need everything that lives uh, to really live well um, ourselves. So let's reunite with the non-humans. This bacterial skin carrier is made by Josephine de Feiter. Well, you see here only a kind of really speculative um, uh, uh, image yet, uh, but she's working at this moment really with creating this bio-based polymer on waste streams of kombucha. And uh, the waste streams are being used to make uh, this uh, polymer that um, you can also maybe use on skin. And maybe the probiotica that are in kombucha waste streams will do a really well, good effect on uh, the skins of people. Because nowadays we do have really sometimes affections of our skins. Um, we are really used to really make it very clean and that's not always well. So we need bacteria in a sort of way. And that is what um, Josephine is showing in her way with creating uh, this beautiful polymer that um, can be colored and can be used for many other purposes. So let's support Josephine. Or let's collect the sun. Marion van Aubel. She um, is working now uh, with the, um, World, um, the World Expo Dubai, meaning for the Dutch um, uh, uh, pavilion that will be there. And she created these solar film panels uh, that you see up there and that are collecting indeed the energy to empower the entire biotope of this um, uh, pavilion, where energy and plants and water get together and all in a very, um, very, a low footprint way 
uh, the pavilion is made of uh, materials that are used in Dubai for many other purposes, so they're only uh, rented right now for this um, uh, exhibition, and will get back and given back, so all cradle to cradle. And this is what Marianne wants to achieve in many other ways, so she wants to create a solar movement. So do you want to maybe join Marianne? Or shall we see how we can create better food scenarios? Um, because um, when there are things changing in our climate, that also means that in 2050, we might eat quite differently. Uh, the Embassy of Food was a, a project we did for um, 2017, so already a few years ago, but it's still not 2050. And many of the projects are still valid. What we did was really taking consumers in the idea of what will you be eating in the future and do you like that? So we also wanted to know whether um, the consumers, so to empower people to see really uh, what kind of different scenarios might be possible and what scenarios they might like or they don't like. So um, this is a way of really getting feedback from audiences uh, that can be used for uh, other organizations to look into how we can kind of really reinvent our food system, which is really very much needed. Um, so let's hack the food system. That's what non-human non, uh, nonsense um, is been, has been working on. So this Berlin, uh, Berlin Stockholm-based agency is really looking in a quite different way of how can we make this really big problem in the world uh, kind of visible because, you know, there are 60 billion chickens e eaten every year by the, uh, the global, the world population, uh, which is an immense uh, number. And they've been thinking about uh, genetically modifying uh, the, the ordinary chicken so that they are turning pink and especially their bones. So it's a kind of speculative idea that um, they are th uh, thinking of. There will be really in the rock strata of the earth at a certain moment this pink layer that really makes clear that we had once these kind of creatures on the planet that were eating so much uh, of that stuff that it would be still visible. It's just to really make things uh, clear to people. Um, like I heard a podcast from Upstream, which is um, uh, reinventing economics and uh, surely not in a capitalist way, you might say. So uh, the same thing is for the people from non-human non nonsense. Like, um, let's really look into another way of um, creating the system of food and creating a, a kind of really balance uh, in this world. So solidarity also with animals. Maybe we should eat less meat. Well, when there would be audience right now, I would have asked, well, what do you see here? What is this, you know? Um, indeed, it's a sausage. Uh, and it's being made by uh, the German designer Doreen Westphal. So um, Doreen is a designer that was working on making circular products, but at a certain moment really thought, I don't want really um, to have only bags or, or maybe maybe fashion made out of uh, circular materials. I really want to have really true impact with the work I'm doing as a designer. So what she's been looking in is, um, is looking into the food, because food is such a big thing, of course, it's all uh, for human beings. So that means that um, what she's been doing is working with, um, at a certain moment, uh, the feet, as we call it, from the oyster mushrooms. So... Doreen is to the left, and the grower Marielle van Lieshout is to the right. And what they've been using is that you see in these plastic bags, um, there is this kind of really basis of the oyster mushrooms. So the oyster mushrooms will be collected and really beautifully put in baskets in the supermarket, and people pay a good price for it. But what, uh, what is happening with the rest? So it was a big uh, waste stream for the grower, but now it's a business model. So she's using um, the basics. Uh, they are now used in the uh, food industry. So like Doreen made this uh, kind of really example of a sausage uh, that she called Plenty 15, which means means that the sausage you can make of fecal or vegetal, uh, vegetal um, content, uh, you can make it 15 times bigger than the one of meat when you look to the amount of land that you need to produce it. So it's a kind of really like, think about the impact also of eating meat. It's in other ways also very important to know that. So um, Doreen nowadays makes them 
good fungi food. And you can find her website. Uh, and she's really turned into a designer still, uh, a graphic designer also, uh, and also a food designer. And um, she's really uh, realizing a lot of impact and not only for herself. So what can we do there? Um, Let's evolve deliciously, which is maybe um, a very interesting uh, way or motto for this movement that is really looking also in what is happening if we as human beings that used to eat everything, 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 we can't eat everything anymore. Or maybe we should not eat everything anymore because we are also a pharma for we eat things because they are healthy. Or we are a climate for because we can't eat everything anymore because it's no longer available. Um, so Katinka Fersendal makes really great dinners together with the chef. Uh, so it's just not like, okay, food design and then hmm, a kind of really experience, but it's really like um, delicious. She's been working with a farmer. Uh, I must say, I don't know his not, uh, name, um, but I think it's a little bit less important because he's really happy with what Katinka did for him. Um, we will maybe when you don't want to drink dairy or you don't want dairy products, you maybe will have soya products. Uh, we're using a lot of soya beans that are coming from China. But what she's been doing, Katinka, is working with farmers in the Netherlands that also grow beans and that get really, really badly paid for it. So the farmers really have a problem also because they are really very badly paid for what they're doing. And that's also not fair. That also should change. So what she's been doing is making uh, with the broad beans, I've seen them here in Poland in the green grocery shop, she made uh, these dairy products that are delicious and good and well, and uh, really can bring a lot of extra value to the farmers and really good food that is locally produced. So feta, camembert, yogurt, and so on. Let's give, I can't read it because my head is there. Uh, <laughs> that's what's happening when you're on screen. Let's give back to nature. That was the idea. That was what I was saying there. So Fides Labi there. She's, she's a social designer. Um, I took the picture on the right because she's been making a photo a reportage uh, on people in the care sector in Holland that were desperately longing for good uh, equipment uh, in the beginning of the corona crisis. And instead they would have really... Uh, flowers, chocolate, uh, sweets, uh, whatever from uh, patients or people that were happy that they, uh, their, pay, their family members were in hospital helped so well. But that didn't help really these care workers um, that also maybe need to be really better paid. So Fides Labadere uh, did do this reportage, but she graduated um, in 2019 with Let's Give Shit. Well, okay, there's Fides, by the way. Um, in a real Dutch landscape. Uh, she created this little uh, food truck. And um, in this food truck, you can uh, pee or poo. Uh, you can use her toilet and you will have a reduction on the beautiful, nice, good sandwiches she makes. And also these sandwiches, they're coming straight from uh, places where uh, organic growing is really um, normal. Uh, because Fides wants to really protest against the fact that we flush away uh, pee and poo, which are really important nutrients for our soil. And meanwhile, we are somewhere on the planet uh, digging for uh, phosphates, for instance, to have um, artificial uh, um, uh, fertilizers. Uh, so she really wants to close the chain and she wants to do this also with building corporations but of course also with citizens with people that they understand how important it is that we really look into a different way to well actually what's happening with this um in this um in this world um we can do things much better so um let's grow in a desert um uh, this is a project of tom bindles uh, so again, about really uh, restoring uh, the um, the health, you might say, of the soil, which is a very important topic in uh, um, Europe. Uh, we have at this moment at the European Commission also projects that are giving extra funding when we're looking into biodiversity and, and soil uh, enrichment. Uh, we really need to do things to, um, well, have food also of soil that is healthy. Uh, but Tom had um, this project when he was in um, a refugee camp uh, uh, in uh, Syria. People that have been there for 17 years and wanted to grow sometimes their own food or wanted to have a little garden. So she, he has made these foldable gardens. That are, or, yeah, he, I think he calls it foldable gardens of cardboard. And there are seats in it. 
and you can fill them because they will go underground. But it's not only in Syria or in the desert, it's also in Uganda, where a lot of soil is being flushed away the moment that there are, uh, that there are heavily rains, which happens more and more often because of the climate crisis. So it's an important, um, an important project that some is taken up. Um, and it has really also very interesting challenges there, because he's now at this moment wondering where does the cardboard need to come from? Um, he's helping farmers uh, in, in Africa, also in other countries. But um, what if the cardboard is not from Finland or from China, but it's made in Africa, which can be done really in a very easy way because there are waste streams really very well. Um, you can use them to make this cardboard and then you would have a kind of ecosystem around uh, these foldable cartons and um, new jobs. So also create an ecosystem and revenues for the local population. So that's Desert Pioneer. Let's bring back the knowledge of the indigenous. Um, this is really, uh, for me personally, uh, a project I really love so much uh, because uh, Fernando Lapos, you see him here with the, uh, uh, the farmers of uh, Tona Wixla, which is in a really uh, corner of Mexico. And he used to go there when he was a kid, have great holidays there. It was like paradise. He came from the big city, Mexico City, very violent and very, very concrete city. And he would be there and enjoy nature and have adventures and then learn also from these really super nice people uh, what life can be about. And at a certain moment, he and his parents went back to France and um, he went to school also in uh, Great Britain. And at a certain moment, um, Fernando was uh, brought back to Mexico because of a residency and that would be about mice. Uh, there's a beautiful interview of him uh, on uh, online uh, and I really recommend to listen to it. It's really uh, so nice and so good because what he's been doing is when he came back to Tona Wixla and he was working on this project about mice and mice is very important for the Mexicans uh, Mexico and uh, Mexicans means the children of mice um, so it's really inherent to the country but meanwhile uh, the mice cultivation was really totally destroyed because of the NAFTA with Canada and United States, Mexico would have very cheap mice imported from uh, USA, which meant that the farmers in Mexico also maybe needed to use the pesticide and fertilizers and the seeds from companies like Monsanto. So um, what happened when Fernando went to this uh, corner in Mexico, it was that people deserted also the fields because they could no longer live from the crops. So it was really totally destroyed this normal ecosystem that they would have in the social system and the economic system in this little community of Tona Wixla. And what he has been doing is really reinventing uh, the uh, ancient uh, cultivation of uh, corn, which is already from, I think, thousands of years ago, uh, from former Toltec or Aztec. Um, uh, it has been, of course, evolved over the, um, the centuries that you will grow pumpkins, you will grow corn, and you will have beans in the corn, and then you have a very healthy ecosystem. You don't need to use all the stuff that industry is delivering. And you have beautiful corn husks in beautiful colors. So um, he started making with the population. So there were the farms, there were everybody involved, also the, the, the women of Tata Wuxla. They started making from these husks uh, this veneer. And uh, of course, um, yeah, he's a designer. So uh, Fernando knows how to make beautiful products of it. And they went all the world. And so did the farmers uh, of Tona Wixla. They went to the World Economic Forum last year to explain what they are doing right now and how they are restoring also the ancient um, mice cultivation in the region. So it's a beautiful story. Um, so look at that. Let's design the unusual and then scale it up. So Erik and Marcia, uh, two designers, uh, the designs of unusual, they um, have always refused to make stuff that is really uh, augmenting or increasing their footprint. They wanted to make stuff that is really good for the world. So um, this is Eric, uh, Eric's graduation work, um, this um, mycelium chair. So it's being grown, a grown chair. And nowadays we can even make grown pavilions, like we had in Dutch Design Week two years ago. 
It's fully bio-based. It can grow indeed. It's not so expensive. Of course, it's still expensive because it's in a prototyping phase. But at this moment, Eric and the company that he founded, and there are really business people behind it, um, they are growing the company to really have a bio-based uh, mycelium procedures, processes uh, to make really good um indeed carbon neutral um, buildings, for instance. And now he's looking since two, three years uh, in the LK because LK is a very um, healthy um, product for us. It is also cleaning the air, but you can also make plastics of it, plastics that are bio-based and that are not uh, destroying the ecosystems on the earth. Uh, also there he's trying to look into how can I upscale this? So the movement needs to be also about upscaling the good movements the good products, the good prototypes. Rethinking plastics is also a very important uh, topic for uh, ICSI Expo. Um, a friend of mine uh, has this exhibition space and she brings together many, many designers that are in very different ways working on what can we do with plastics. Um, so Kundeka Straberka, um, she uh, has um, been working on creating kind of new crafts, you might say, because we uh, are uh, a kind of I, we not, I think the fishing industry, is uh, throwing around 640,000 tons or something. I can't remember all the names, but I can give them to you later, uh, of fish nets. Um, and these fish nets you can use to really make new stuff out of it, but they should not be thrown in the seas anyway, you could say. So Kuniga is um, creating a kind of speculative scenario that these coastal regions could have new crafts maybe and could start really creating kind of new landscapes, you might say, uh, on basis of those nets but um, of course this is just because we know that the fishing industry is heavily um, suffering from the fact that there are kind of really fish factories uh, in the sea that take away the fish for the local fishermen so it's also again a kind of activism and a kind of really awareness raising and then looking into what can we do next so let's create value with waste and this is a very um I think a lot of people know this project, maybe also the people here. Um, Precious Plastic is, uh, has turned into a movement, has been really grown really worldwide. Um, and um, the founder of Precious Plastic, Dave Hawkins, um, he really is now like, um, I don't want to be uh, really the person behind Precious Plastic because there's so many people working on it and I'm not important anymore. Other people can do the job. So with 300,000 euro that he once won, um, he uh, has brought together a team, uh, an international team in the city of Eindhoven. And they're really looking into all kinds of ways how you can really reuse plastics and make really good, uh, valuable stuff out of that. And I was very, um, I just uh, saw this little movie of one of the guys there, or there was a guy, there can be girls as well, but this was a guy and he was using the mouth caps that we uh, are wearing uh, and that we are finding in everywhere in the streets. Um, and he was really looking into the way, what can we make of all these mouth caps? Because it's about millions, or I don't know, I think maybe even billions of mouth caps. I can't, sometimes these figures are so big that you can't imagine them. And they are looking into how can we reuse this material because it's all about petrol based material in the end um, so they can also give really good indications about people that produce them to do it a bit more circular like cradle to cradle um, so a movement another movement like maybe having in your garage box these open source machines uh, with which you can really well a kind of really shred the plastic and make uh, new materials out of it or let's boost the fashion revolution um, the fashion industry is the second most polluting industry in the world. And it's not that I only want to give negative scenarios, but I think we should be also a bit realistic because there are a lot of things going on that cannot longer continue. Uh, so even when Dutch Design Week was not there last year, uh, we had this store in uh, one of our um, uh, malls, shopping mall, so next to, I think, McCracker or something. Um, we had this really remake studio, um, and it was based on uh, some of the uh, projects that uh, during the COVID crisis, Harm, Alicia and Bart were doing. Uh, to see uh, what would happen when we they would ask people in Eindhoven to donate their uh, clothes. So, of course, um, these garments bring value. They have been looking into how can we repair this value uh, or how can we augment this value as well. And they're working nowadays with a, um, uh, a company that's making new yarns of certain uh, garments. But that also, given the fact that these garments are not made like some of top shops are, you are 
only for single use, or you put them once in a washing machine and then you can throw them away. And when you throw them away and they go to Africa, where people really try to look into what can we still do with all these garments that coming imported from the West and that have no value at all. So it's polluting also um, the coasts of Africa. All this, the documentaries, um, the way they're looking into solutions, it's all um, in this new order of fashion from scratch project. And I do hope that the digital fashion, so that's another movement maybe, from Amber J. Sloten, who is the first um, digital fashion designer, you might say, uh, because she decided when she graduate, uh, graduated, yes, you could say, um, I think three years ago, I'm not going to make all those collections. I'm not going to produce uh, four times a year. I'm going to do it digitally. Uh, and um, this is what she did last year. She sold um, this uh, iridescence dress, uh, which is totally um, digital. So the owner who sold it for or uh, bought it for $9,500, she has been uh, wearing it on Facebook and Instagram, I think. So um, this is maybe the future. And maybe this is also a future. Uh, creating affinity and that brings me to Poland because I do hope that there are a lot of Polish people also um, online and that they also want to go and give us uh, me feedback and also the people that I uh, I was introducing all those designers uh, when you see maybe connections please come with it um, Aniela Fittler, Wiruszewska um, she misses her mom uh, she lives in London since I think six or seven years now uh, graduated there on fashion but she doesn't like to make um, fashion series. She only makes unique pieces. Um, so what she made or did with these diamonds from, uh, from Mom's Cake, that was another project that she's doing because she's really looking at how can I create connection? How can I create a kind of affinity? How can I really have people like really understanding the preciousness of a um, product that they're buying? Why can you, can't you keep something forever? So diamonds are forever, but they are also costing uh, maybe one salary or more. Uh, why would you do that? So she was. Uh, she has been demanding that to people. So what would you like to have? What is really precious to you? And then maybe in a diamond. So she used her mom's um, her mom's cake and she burned it and then she made from this. Uh, it was made, of course, by a laboratory. Uh, this diamond of her mom's cake. But she said, "Why would I do this anyway? Um, I want to have real stuff. I want to have real people telling me stories. And that's what it's all about. We want to own what we are." Um, um, in a real good way and not throw it away instantly. Uh, so this is uh, a jacket she also uh, created in a unique, uh, only one single item, but it's being used also for social design. Um, it's storytelling uh, of many people. Uh, it's also something that really people relate to it. Uh, so it's asking for more, but they will all be unique pieces. So that's Aniela. And then I come to the last person, that's Design Empathy. Because um, when we're thinking about the people in Uganda that cannot have vaccinations, we will maybe think, oh, that's sick. We should do something against it. What can we do? Uh, but the moment that you um, don't really relate to people, have no idea uh, who people are or what their lives is, it's really hard for us sometimes to imagine. So the Inembo embassy from Manon van Hoekel uh, was an idea of um, what she took up because she said, I don't know anybody in the Netherlands or I don't know any refugees. I don't know any people. I never talked to them. So she has this mobile office, um, you might say, this um, like little caravan thing. It's a beautiful thing. And um, she would have ambassadors uh, that would explain people that are in limbo because they are not having the right permits yet um, and they do have to hope to get them and they would talk to people in neighborhoods where the um, the caravan would be put so this is how we can also really maybe start creating connection because we need to redesign economy we need to understand like Kate Rayworth does with this visualization um, this is a very simple one um, the donut uh, like we have this social basics that we really need to take care of and that should not be touched by anyone we should really avoid that and then there are the planetary boundaries of course as well it's something that everybody needs to know um, on this planet uh, and especially the people that are like me uh, using two and a half planet or something for the way we are living 
So we cannot go on longer than this. Designing for politics means also that we um, will need to look into another way of um, uh, creating better politics. And that's what Bernard Langer is doing with Polly Higgins, a barrister. Um, uh, she passed away uh, two years ago, really very sad because she was really working as a lawyer for the planet. So she really thought the planet needs to be defended as well. And studio, well, Bernard Langer made this uh, corporate identity to make it really something that everybody could relate to and would really see this is a very official and important organization. And then I end with the um, new European Bauhaus. Mm, well, let's look to Ursula von der Leyen because I really think she's a heroine for me. She's really so courageous uh, together with other people at the Euro Com uh, European Commission uh, to really look into um, how can we make Europe better in a way of beautiful, sustainable and inclusive. And there are many new European Bauhauses um, built and developed at this moment. And I really think that we need to look into it. How can we dare also create this movement that uh, Ursula von der Leyen was announcing and work together on making a change. So um, this is an overview of all the projects that I brought to you. Um, so I want to hear whether there's one of the projects that you really think I would love to work on that more. I think that's really something I would like to unite around and to see whether we can maybe create uh, more people um, to make it really happen, to upscale it, to find people also to, um, to make it from like a prototype to something real. Um, so from awareness to really action. Um, I can say it again, there's the design for flies, there's the solar, um, uh, the solar panels, the solar movement. Um, then maybe the pink chicken project is also because of animal welfare. So thinking about how are we doing, dealing with this and changing to more vegan diet. Um, and that's also what I think uh, our friend is doing, uh, Katinka, um, thinking about our soil, thinking about growing bio-based materials, etc. So, um, I don't know. I think you maybe made some notes and I really would love to hear from you what you think is really important for you. So thank you so much um, for at this moment listening to me. Um, I really would love to hear something back because it's like, who? and I've got an idea because I recently was with um, a little girl, a boy. I brought him a book because um, I didn't meet him yet and he's now one and a half. So um, he, kept, he got his book from me. And um, because I think when you uh, are, are starting a movement, you also need something to unite. So you need to do maybe a movement. And my idea was that maybe we could also use the movement that I did with this little boy. So he opened his um, uh, his uh, present and he was so happy. So like, oh, wow. And I said, I said whoa. I said, whoa, <laughs> ain't this great? So um, this brings really great energy. So maybe we can use the whoa or maybe somebody else has another idea of how can we start movements to create these changes that are needed how can we augment and increase solidarity thank you very much ingrid the first question <laughs> <laughs> uh, has covid 19 made uh, people more in uh, need of solidarity or in on the contrary have made them more distant yeah well, I do hope, though, that indeed solidarity, uh, we chose this team for Kalinia Design Days because solidarity is what we want. Exactly. We want to be connected. Okay. Um, uh, the second question will be like, uh, what future scenarios are particularly exciting uh, you and what uh, technologies or possibilities are you waiting for? <laughs> well, um, I think that I want to focus, first of all, on um, not the technological possibilities because we have already a lot of technological solutions and I'm also looking into next nature things like also like maybe we can have things embedded in us and then maybe we will be solidary creatures. But but I do hope that um, as human beings, we um, can really reconnect with the beings uh, around us, um, which means everything that lives around us. And I really uh, look very much forward. Their food is, of course, a very important topic. And it's a topic really close to my heart as well. Mm -hmm. Food. Um, food, mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, but it doesn't, I think that every project that I chose here, and it was really hard to make a choice because there's such a beautiful and important projects are being made. Um, but I, I tried to give an overview of um, really the, the good intentions of everyone uh, and also um, the real the potential that's in these projects um, that I do hope that, well, maybe all of these projects really at a certain moment will be really go uh, over the planet um, to bring good.
Mm, okay. And uh, if the word solidarity could be materialized, what form would it take? <laughs> a hug. No, 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 that's maybe. <laughs> a hug, yeah, that's right. Or maybe it could be also a table yeah. uh, where people would be seated a round around. Table. Yeah, a round table and we would eat and we would talk and we would think and then... Also, maybe it would be a workspace, where you, a kitchen, where you would create and you would deliver from the kitchen. Kitchens are always the place where people meet <laughs> yeah. and start the party and end the party. Yeah, I think it's important. <laughs> uh, it's one of the most important uh, p uh, places of the house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think that uh, that's um, what I'm thinking of right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Ingrid. With pleasure.